Thank you. It's uh, now my pleasure to uh, introduce a uh, low vision specialist. Uh, Dr. Uh, Fatino is in private practice as a low vision specialist in St. Petersburg. He's authored numerous articles, book chapters, and has been involved in clinical research throughout his career. Dr. Patino is an active member of the American Optometric Association, Florida Optometric Association, and is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry. Dr. Patino. Thank you. After hearing with Dr. Tolentino, I don't know if I need to be mow or oil with all the rust I'm talking about today. We, um, first thing we'll go through is some definitions because when patients come to see me, the first thing they want to know is, am I going to go blind? Or they tell me they're already blind. Typically, macular degeneration patients. So, the first thing we have to clear that up. Everybody close their eyes. Close their eyes. That's blind. Okay, open up. No matter how bad your vision is, you notice a difference there, right? So, blind is the absence of sight. And thankfully, very few people have that condition. So there are some. There are people that aren't truly blind. And, you know, those are the guys that we can really say from the vision perspective, we can't do anything for them. And that's really the only population that that phrase applies to probably a retina specialist or a glaucoma specialist or a cataract surgeon says there's nothing I can do for you, they're talking about cure that disease, right? So all the things that Dr. Tolentino and Dr. Dupree talked about doesn't get rid of macular degeneration. It controls it, it makes it better, it improves it, or if it's already scarred, then they can't do improvement or stabilization anymore, right? So that's when they say that, they say, there's nothing I can do for you, that's what they mean. When the low vision specialist says, there's nothing I can do for you, well, that means that, you know, it's like you're walking around with your eyes closed. There's, there's no sight there. No. Then we have the term legal blindness. Now, you would think that means as opposed to illegal blindness, right? <laughs> so I'm legally blind, so the cops won't bother me, or I'm illegally blind, and I'm going to go to jail. Back in, the, back in the 60s, when governments, particularly elsewhere in the world, started deciding that people who have vision impairment need help, which was going to be provided by somebody or some organization or some governmental agency, they had to draw a line that says, okay, everybody who's on this side of the line will help, and everybody who's on this side of the line is on your own. Because, you know, you can't help everybody. So, the World Health Organization, you know, got a bunch of experts together and said, okay, so which, where are we going to draw this line? So if you're on one side, we help you with stuff, and if you're on the other side, you're on your own. And the definition came out to be 2200 or worse, in the best eye, with normal correction. So if you have glasses, contact lenses, cheaters, whatever, normal eye correction, and your vision is better than 2200 with that, then you're not legally blind. And there's another bunch of people that, you know, can see 2020, but only in a little bitty spot. And so they bump into the chairs and they can't get around in the world from glaucoma, magnetic pigmentosa, various diseases. So they decided if you have less than 20 degrees of field in your better eye, those guys also need help. So that's legally blind. So somebody comes in and says, without my glasses, I'm legally blind. Well, no, because put your glasses back on and you're not legally blind. So therefore you're not. Those are the illegally blind people. <laughs> And there's low vision, right? What's low vision? And, and you have a handout with a definition of it that's pretty good. You know, any level of vision that prevents you from doing the things you need or want to do is low vision. 
or you know that gets confused with visual impairment, but which has an actual definition of 2070. Okay, so instead of the 2200 meaning legally blind, people who have a little better vision but not great, 2070 will qualify for some things like school programs. If you're a school age kid, if you have 2070 or worse, they'll help you. They'll give you additional devices and help and time and all that kind of stuff. So that's the definitions to bet on. Them. And the effects, uh, you know, the nice thing is I've got way more slides and way more things to talk about than 30 minutes is going to give me. And the reason is because I know from experience coming behind all these guys, they're going to steal a lot of my thunder. So you've already been wowed by a lot of this stuff. We're going to blow by that. The, um, the visual effects of, of in low vision can be one of three things. Right? We can have decreased acuity, the 2200 guys, the central scotoma, blind spot in the middle, that's when all the macular degeneration patients, macular holes, any macular disease, you know, uh, diabetic macular edema, all of those diseases that affect the macula cause a central scotoma, a blind spot wherever you point your eye. It doesn't make a blind spot everywhere else, just where you point your eye, which of course is the part of the world you're trying to look at. That's what makes it so disconcerting, you know. If everybody has a blind spot, and, I, and, and you're looking here, and I move over here, I'm no longer in your blind spot. You can see me, but you still can't see what's over there. And that's the central vision loss. Or we can reverse that, like with glaucoma or that is pigmentosa, and we can wipe out the periphery so that as I'm standing here and you're looking at me, you only see my head. Everything else in the room is gone. Well, you can read that way. If the words are small and the letters are small, you can still read that. But you can't get up and walk through this room without bumping into everybody because we use our peripheral vision for our locomotion vision. So, the person who has both of those things together is in bad shape, right? Because you don't have the periphery and you don't have the center. That might be those guys, a small group of people that are actually blind. Or you can have a functional depression across the whole field like a cataract would give you, or uh, optic, optic nerve disease will give you a, a just fades out. I mean, you can see everything, but it's like you're looking through a uh, dense fog at it. You know, when you're driving, driving down the road or riding down the road and it's really foggy, you can see the signs go by and you can see the bus go by and you can see all that stuff, but you can't see it very well. You know it's there, you notice some little details about it, but you can't really tell what's going on. And then there's the non-visual effects of psychological, economic, and social, and that's where, you know, those are the biggest problems, really. The, the optical stuff, we've got pretty good ways to get around, but you know, it causes economic hardship, it changes family dynamics dramatically, it, it may change, the, you know, your independence is lost, you can't drive anymore, you may have to go into assisted living situations or live with family members, you need help to go to the grocery store, buy the essentials for life, all of those things are very important and, and my goal, everybody who works with low vision's goal is to maximize that independence to the point you can. Common causes of, of low vision, age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, cataract, cornea, and surface disease, other problems, strokes, optic nerve damage, uh, corneal diseases, there's there, just about anything that causes permanent damage to the eye or the visual system causes low vision, if it's severe enough. Biggest difference in the way that and I was poking these guys earlier because of this, or because of this fact right here. In the eye, you know, the eye is one single little organ in the visual system. You know, and we tend to divide our medicine into, into organs. You know, you've got GI doctors, you've got kidney doctor, urologist, you've got uh, cardiologist, you've got neurologist for the nerves, we got ophthalmologist, optometrist. Opticians deal with eye stuff, right? And within the ophthalmology world, you probably break it down even further. So you got cataract surgeons, retinal surgeon, properly called vitreoretinal surgeons, which is why they use iritis and uveitis. 
glaucoma surgeons. So it divides into little, now we're not even talking about the organ, now we're talking about pieces of the organ that they had to be the expert in. The reason is, look how much information just comes in this, in this, today, we're not even talking about the whole eye or the whole retina. We're only talking about the central five degrees of the retina. And there's all of this information that deals with it. So it's a huge field for a little bitty organ. Right? You could take two of those eyes and stick them in your pocket and nobody would even know you had them. That's how small they are. But when you combine the diseases that happen to eyes or the visual system, it gets really much more devastating. It's not like adding one and one and getting two. It's like adding one and one and getting 11. So if you have a cataract and macular degeneration, so now you've got a blind spot in the middle, and the peripheral vision that you rely on is in a fog. That's a lot different than if you had that clear periphery that you can use to get around, to see better, to, to work with magnification with. Same thing with glaucoma. If I take out some of that periphery, and I take out the center, and now you have a ring of vision, so that, like you're looking through a donut all the time, so if things show up on the, you know, they're, they're, they're not there, then they're there, then they disappear again. As you try to read across the page, the, the, the words are blinking on and off as you go. Even if I make them bigger, right, I may make them too big, so that now you only see letters blink on and off as you try to read. So those two things combined is much more devastating. The same thing happens with diabetes or traumatic disease or corneal disease. And we've already seen all the pictures, so I don't need to go through that. But here's cataract. The center part of the eye, there's another picture with a clear one coming up, should be clear. So if you see the picture on the right with the car, with the, the car, and here's a little girl walking across the road, so if it's cloudy, the, the cloudier it gets, the harder it is to see her, right? And now I got a really bad cataract or a really bright day, and, and that's the same picture, but you can't see the little girl anymore. So if we add that to, oh, that relates to, some people, this is Van Gogh's Starry Night. So the reason he painted this way, they think, is because he had cataracts. So everything was, you know, if you go back a minute and we look at how cloudy things are. So she's, she's in a little haze and not that clear. As it gets worse, kind of looks like what he did to the stars up here. So it kind of explains his whole genre to say he had early cataracts and they're, and and that sort of explains the art. Uh, I don't know how we explain Picasso. I can't, I can't figure out what happened to his visual system made him do that stuff, so we'll pass him by. But here's a scene, this is a healthy eye, seeing normally, and we stick macular degeneration into the mix, and uh, okay, so now we can see all the periphery, right? But, but the lady's head disappeared, or became all distorted and disappeared, right? If I, if I then look at what she looked like just with a cataract, okay, now everything's all foggy and everything, right? That's kind of like the little girl in the car. I put the two together. Wait a minute. What happened to my together? Oh, well. There's supposed to be one where they're both on top of each other, and I don't know what happened to that slide. You'd see her face disappeared, and then all the periphery would be blurred. And that's not <coughs> 25, over the... See, I came here in 89. Over that 22 years, in four locations, the initial low vision patients that have been sent to my office. Now, realize, every patient that comes to me for low vision has come from another doctor to me. Somebody just sent them. Somebody just looked at them. Did an exam. Maybe have done exams over two years or three years on them, right? It may be a specialist in glaucoma sends me a patient because now their glaucoma is calling, causing trouble with them seeing, so now they have low vision. Or maybe from a retinal specialist who's been treating with Lucentis or in the old days with laser, done all they can do, and now the person is complaining, but I can't read the paper. Yeah, it's better, but I still can't read. So then they send them to me. 25%, this statistic has been true since 1989, in locations in Winter Haven, Lakeland, Tampa, and Pinellas County. 25% of those referred for low vision services have another treatable condition that needs to be addressed. One quarter of them. 
They have a cataract that's been untreated. They have glaucoma and didn't know it because nobody's doing a field on somebody who has, low, has an active disease and didn't catch it. What well, something, right? So the first thing we have to do is this is this is a lady who's got a red eye. She self-referred. She came in. Everything's fine. I just have this red eye. This is called a subconjunctival hemorrhage. It looks terrible, but it doesn't do anything to your vision. However, once we look inside, she also has a central retinal vein occlusion. So she's got hemorrhages all over. Her vision is reduced in that eye. It has nothing to do with the outside appearance, which is the reason she came. But she has a, a sight-threatening condition going on inside the eye. So she has to go out for treatment. Before, before I do, I mean, I'm not going to treat that, uh, the outside part. So the, the strategy that we use in low vision is we confirm and establish all the diagnosis that can be affecting the eye. And, that, and that's a big difference in when patients come in. Often, you know, they'll sit down and they say, okay, I'm here, I've got macular degeneration, I want to read the paper. Sounds simple. They see Dr. X, whatever. And... We go through the routine and we say, okay, so you have macular degeneration. It's dry, like you were told. So you don't need any injection. You don't need any laser. You don't need any treatment. But you don't respond to magnification because you have a cataract and you have dry eye. So we have to treat the dry eye so that we can form an image and we have to get rid of the cataract before we can do the low vision. Because no matter how badly or highly I magnify something, if it goes through a cataract that chews up the image before it gets to the retina, I can't, I can't have any effect. So we refer them, they come back, we reestablish um, what they need. There's a, one of the first patients, low vision patients I took care of when I got to Pinellas County. I, I came here from New York. I was a professor at the State University of New York and did um, strabismus research at Columbia University. And when I got here, the first, probably the first low vision patient I, I dealt with, I came down and I'm going to fix everybody. I'm, I'm some hot shot, man. Like Columbia, SUNY, Manhattan Ioneer, New York Ioneer. I'm the top of the world, man. Come down here. You guys are lucky I'm here. So this lady comes in and she wants to see. She is a big, there's a place in Clearwater called the Cardwell Club or organism. It's a, it's a new, it's a, it's at the tip of, Ca of uh, Clearwater Beach. Yeah. It's a yacht club and it's a, it's a community. Well, the car means Carolyn, Lou was Louise, and L was Elizabeth. The three men who developed that area, that was their wife's name. I won't tell you which one, but one of those three was the patient I was ta I'm talking about. So. She was very big in Tennessee walking horses. You know, those are horses that they have this big gait. They, you know, pretty, pretty useless horses except for that, you know, show stuff. But she was very big and she hadn't been able to see. Her granddaughter was a champion, grand champion, or going for the grand champion moniker. And she hadn't been able to see that very well for years. Came in and we went through the routine and she had macular degeneration. And she had cataracts. But the cataracts, quote, weren't right. Right? How many people have heard that term? Cataracts aren't right. Yeah, almost everybody, right? Well, they're not like grapes. You gotta get a certain place, and then it, it's more like when they cause a problem, they need to come out. So the Steubenville, Tennessee, I think, is is the uh, is the headquarters for this grand champion Tennessee walking thing. And it was coming up in about a month. So I said, well, okay, so here's what happens with the, this is one of the problems. There's a little girl. Anyway, I, I ordered telescopes for a total of about $4,000. And I sent her out for cataract surgery. They did the cataract surgery. She came back about the same time the telescopes were ready. She comes in, she went out of 2200. She came back at 2040 out of the cataract surgery. 
So I still have those telescopes if anybody wants them. Because she didn't need them anymore. That was, a, that was the first low vision case. Where I thought of a big house shot, I'm going to get these big telescopes if she's going to be able to see everything. All she needed was cataract surgery. It was a minor problem was the macular degeneration. And I learned that lesson and haven't had that happen before. Here's what happens with macular degeneration. The little girl's face goes away. But if we teach you to look off to the side, the appropriate spot, so yeah, now I can't see your shoulder, but I can see your face again, right? It's not perfect. And we may need a little enhancement of that image to see well enough to tell if it's, you know, Julia or, or uh, Jackie, or the two girls or whatever. But that's the way we, and of course there's, there's different directions we can train you to look in. That's called eccentric viewing. First thing when we're going to treat a central loss is to find out where's the good spot, and then how do you use that spot. Then we may have to magnify it. Um, big problem for, for us these days, more and more these days, is, is dry eye. A lot of people, especially in the elderly, you know, 10,000 men, we've heard these statistics already, so 10,000 Americans turn 50 every day, and uh, this is the most common pathology for the next two decades, it's going to be dry eye. And so the surface of the eye is dry, it's very cloudy, like a cataract would do, and it's very intermittent. If I blink twice, I put some drops in, I see gray for like five minutes. And then I see terribly again. So it's very disconcerting to have uh, vision that comes and goes based on the wetness of my eye. An extreme example is I have a little boy who has an artificial cornea who when he's wet is 2030. When he's dry is 2400. He dries every five minutes. The school, because they have a zero tolerance for self-administered drugs, won't let them use eye drops in school. I spend a lot of time arguing with administrators at schools. So with dry eye, you see on the left, it's, it's, that's a pretty severe case. These are uh, filamentary keratitis, which is dead. So I'll point this way. Right uh, here, these are little collections of dead cells and mucus on the surface that's stuck to the eye. And of course, the tear film won't stick to all of that, so it's very dry, very distorted. Oh, here's a pointer. Okay, so I can do it this way. There, these little spots. An eye like that, I can't do anything with magnification as long as that condition exists. So a lot of times, the first month or so I'm involved with somebody is fixing this dry eye. It may take a month to three months if it's severe like that. We can just put drops in it, but like I said, that works about five minutes, and then you got to put another drop in. And you know, somebody with arthritis and a frozen shoulder and a few other things going on isn't going to be able to do that all day long. Yeah, that's Let's skip that. Here's the clear. That's what an eye without a cataract looks like. It's, a, it's pretty far back. Let's see. If we compare, oops, there it is. That that central look to don't throw up anybody. To that central look, you can see obviously much clearer. So this is what we want. It's not there for this, by the way. It's there for all this garbage on the lid. Looks like dandruff. But that, that's called blepharitis. One of the leading causes of dry eyes. We have to fix those sometimes. Sometimes, many times, twice last week, have a patient that comes in. This is, there's their pupil, half of their pupil, right? So what I said earlier, macular degeneration, we have to have a lot of life. Somebody who wants to read, first thing you do is up the light and they read better. They see better. If they have cataracts, the, the more light you put on the cataract, the worse you see. The more light you put on macular degeneration, the better you see. Can't balance those two things. That's a catch-22. This, if this person's half of the pupils blocked by the lid falling down, obviously I can only get half the light in it. No matter how much light I put on the page, only half of it's getting through there. So we sometimes have to send them out for uh, 
mixer before we can do an audition. And these are a few more things. Uh, and then sometimes clouds get in your eye. Uh, <laughs> Rene Marguerite, 1928, Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, what do we do with optics, okay? There's conventional solutions. This is stuff that you go and get yourself. Hand magnifiers. Some people just say, well, I'm not going to read anymore because it's too hard. Magnifying glasses, loops, lighting magnifiers, and stand magnifiers. That's, that's what they look like. They work to a certain extent, but only if you know how to use them. A 3x magnifier is only 3x if you're the right distance from the page and the right distance from your face. Change either of those distances, and it's no longer 3x, it's less. So people typically go, they need 3x, they go by 6, and they use them inappropriately. Of course, that means that they're seeing a very little spot. Professional solutions involve, we may use the conventional solution, may give you a magnifier for a particular thing, seeing, seeing the numbers on your microwave. Because of the distance it is away, it might be the best solution. Rehabilitation programs, either home-based or, or in, in, in lighthouses and things like that, we can use non-optical devices and sophisticated optics. Okay. Rehabilitation programs typically will deal with activities of daily living, maybe teach you Braille, computer access, O&M, job placement. Uh, this is there to remind, that's Ellis Island, to remind me that most of the, what you probably heard, right, most of the people that need that macular degeneration came through here, and some, or their, or their parents did, from Europe. Non-optical devices, filters, large print cards or large print anything. Um, large print glucose meters are those that talk. If you have, we have large print syringes and uh, large print pill bottles and, and, you know, ability to mark your medications in different ways. So you know which one is the first one in the morning, the second pill, the third pill, and the nighttime pill. So those kinds of, of Adaptive things can be taught either in the home or in the program that you go to. Things that we can do at home, look at contrast, okay? So if I give somebody who's, who's got poor vision from any of these things we talk about, cataracts, glaucoma, macular degeneration, and I say, okay, find the, the mashed potatoes on that plate, I can't find the mashed potatoes on that plate, right? So if I put a white food on a white plate, and give it to somebody who sees 2200, they'll never find it. But if I make the plate dark, right, now I can find the mashed potatoes very nicely. I can find the dark food on the light plate very nicely. I can find the dark, the, the plate on a dark background table very nicely, but not so good on a white table. So that's the, those are the kinds of adaptations that, uh, rehabilitation programs will talk about and help you with. Same thing, I mean, get down to how a toilet works for somebody. You know, men are aiming at that good to start with, but when you can't see what you're aiming at, then it's even worse, right? A, a, different, a different targeting system here would help. We look over here at the counter, how am I going to find this door pull or, or, or handle for the drawer if it's white or silver against a white drawer, but if a little change in, in design, put a blue one with a you know, blue face, see there's simple things that, that can be done in the home to make it easier for people. This is the lighthouse in, in Pinellas County. When they, start, when they redid it, you know, they were almost to the point of being done, and I said um, they, had, they had white walls and cream-colored carpet originally. And they wanted people to be able to find their way down the hallway. And they said, well, you know, how are you going to do that? So they came up with this other, you know, modification where they put tile at the, at the crossroads between uh, hallways so that as you're walking along, the, the, the feeling changes at your feet. And, it, and then a dark border along the hall, so now you've got a, basically a runway for people to go down. Okay, we can use uh, sophisticated optics, and you know this is one that I that I invented. If 
if we're going to talk about what we do in the world here, there's telescopes, and there's a, there's a wide variety of these things that we can utilize. This is how a telescope works in those states that you can actually use them to drive. You mount the telescope high, and then when you look through it, it gives you the magnification. But notice it doesn't give you a big field. That's the problem with the telescope. Just like he's using binoculars over here, right? So he sees my head real big. Poor, poor man. <laughs> uh, that's and we can use, uh, and in the back, you can see the examples of this. It's great that you know, they're here. So you can see what electro-optical devices can do. And there are various you know, versions of that, handheld, portable, big desk-mounted jobs like that, and what's in the back, head-mounted. This is, this is called a Jordi. And we're going to skip all those. Oh, there we go. And I was in the, uh, on the observation deck of the, of the uh, Empire State Building. Empire State Building, right. And, and walking around, and so you're, you're almost a thousand feet in the air, and, and there's a pigeon sitting there looking at you and thinking, why would a pigeon be this high in New York City? And obviously it's for the view. <laughs> okay, that, so that's, I made it 10 minutes in, twi in, in what, 20, right? <laughs> And what, I'm sure we'll get some questions, you know, we're going to do another one of these panels so we can deal with questions. Thank you, Dr. Peter.